Good afternoon. Today is Friday, January 15th, 2016. We are here today to interview Governor A. Linwood Holton, former governor of Virginia, who made George Mason College independent from the University of Virginia in 1972, among many other important achievements during his governorship. My name is Emily Curley, and Robert Bay is assisting. We are conducting this interview on behalf of the George Mason University Oral History Program. Our interview is taking place at Governor Holton's home in Irvington, Virginia. So thank you so much for meeting with us today. Um, so to begin, can, can you tell me how, when, and why you got into the Virginia political scene? That's something that apparently I was born with because uh, from a very early stage I was interested in politics in Virginia. And uh, from my earliest days of memory, I assumed that I was going to be active in the political world of Virginia. I was determined to break up the bird machine, which had dominated politics in Virginia for at least one generation. And if you, if you include the part of the machine that preceded Harry Bird Sr., you get at least two generations of one faction of one party dominating the political affairs of Virginia. And I was determined to break it up. The uh, approach that I used was to uh, try, it's not, it wasn't a question of rehabilitation, uh, re recreate it just didn't, the Republican Party didn't exist in Virginia really they were nominally some but it, it wasn't a party they didn't run candidates on a serious basis and uh, yet I, I used it uh, because it was very popular nationally at the time Eisenhower was in the offing, he had not yet identified with the Republican Party when I started, but uh, he was very popular and it was very obvious that he was probably going to be identified. And that would be a help nationally to create interest in a Republican organization in the state of Virginia. So I tried to use that national uh, natural resource to create a Republican Party on a statewide basis. And uh, when the time came to decide what to do and where to go for making a living and having a career as an adult, I picked Roanoke as being a very logical place for the creation of a base for the Republican Party. Roanoke was a relatively new city. It was not burdened with uh, a long time democratic heritage. And uh, it had a lot of people from out of state that already lived there that were willing to take a look at the political picture on an impartial basis. And so I made the decision that I would come to Roanoke to practice law and also activate myself in the political picture. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in your book, um, Opportunity Time, you mentioned the relationship of the bird machine to your own political career. Uh, could you briefly describe the nature of the bird machine and its effects on Virginia with respect to politics the economy, services, uh, infrastructure, and education? <laughs> well, the, uh, the bird machine dominated the political activities of Virginia, on, particularly on a statewide basis. They had begun to slip on a national basis. Uh, Virginia was, uh, well, the bird organization never really got into politics on a national basis very much. They, they ignored the presidential elections and realized that the 
people in Virginia were probably going to be uh, interested in re being Republican nationally, electing Republican candidates for president, and uh, the Byrd organization just did not get into that. But the Byrd organization, through a series of county organizations, there are five constitutional offices in each county. They're created by the Constitution of Virginia. And those five officers constituted the basic uh, staffing and structure of the Byrd organization. You didn't get to be a Commonwealth attorney or a clerk of the court unless you were a Byrd supporter. And therefore, Byrd organization could go to any county in the state and know that it had an organization to begin with on that statewide basis. And they controlled who got elected to the General Assembly of Virginia. They controlled who was appointed judges to Virginia judgeships and uh, pretty much controlled uh, the election of United States senators. But uh, as far as economic, uh, that, that just falls along naturally because the uh, structure of the political activity was pretty much fixed and the, the, it was very business friendly. And uh, beginning with uh, Governor Harrison, <coughs> who was not so seriously involved in the massive resistance effort, um, he, he, be, he began to convince the state to stop looking over its shoulder and worrying about racial discrimination and tried to develop economically uh, as a matter of providing jobs for people in Virginia. <clears throat> and that began the turnover from a rural to a, um, a more industrial state. And uh, that, that's about the way the economic developed. It began with Governor Harrison he created the uh, commission for the community college system. And all of that was designed to effectuate a good policy of economic development. So they were in favor of, by that time, they were in favor uh, of economic development on a modern basis as opposed to the, the, the rural approach that had been dominant in the years past. The bird machine's effect on education and infrastructure within the state. Well, it, most of the leadership of the, Repub of, of the bird machine didn't believe in education. So salaries were low, kept low to keep the taxes low. And Education was neglected, both at public school level and at higher education. So uh, that was one of the major uh, achievements of when Virginia discarded the bird machine. It, it began to recognize the opportunity in education and began to make serious investments. And we have developed a, a very significant series of four-year institu research institutions that are outstanding. And that's something that would not have happened if the bird machine had continued to dominate the government of Virginia. Right. Uh, so in your book, um, you mentioned that there are a few areas of Virginia that didn't necessarily go along with, with bird politics, and Northern Virginia was one of them. Um, how would you describe the, the people and, and politics of Northern Virginia during this era? Well, it all started uh, centered on Arlington County at the time. Fairfax was still a pasture field, but uh, uh, there, were, there was a 
clearly an overflow of population from the district into Virginia, and it centered on Arlington County. Uh, so you had a lot of people who were not Virginians and were not uh, uh, a part of the tradition of Virginia, which goes back to colonial days. And uh, uh, it, it was interested in education. It was interested in making money. It was interested in good governmental policies. And uh, that the growth in Northern Virginia began in Arlington County and spread to the other counties, Prince William and Fairfax principally, and the city of, of uh, um, what's, the, what's the big city? Arlington, Alexandria. Alexandria. Um, so, in opportunity time, you discuss a number of acquaintances of yours who happen to be important to the early development of George Mason University. Um, could you tell us a little bit about some of the following people, uh, beginning with Governor Colgate W. Darden? I didn't realize that Governor Darden had any particular interest in Northern Virginia, uh, but um, I had introduced myself to Governor Darden when I was campaigning uh, on both in 1965 and 1969 and had developed a real pleasant relationship of friendship with him. Um, he was a, a forward-looking elder statesman and was interested in me, uh, but I don't remember any particular concentration of his interest in the Northern Virginia area, although he recognized, as anybody who was aware of, of, of the situation, that the population in Northern Virginia and Tidewater was growing and was going to be increasingly significant in the political life of Virginia. Uh, that's all I know about his connection with it now. You're, Edgar Shannon was president of the University of Virginia. He was a very close friend of mine because I had met him when I was a freshman at Washington and Lee, and he was back uh, as an alumnus for the <coughs> Rush Week uh, during my very first week on the campus at WNL. And he was then by then president of the University of Virginia, and he, he did recognize the opportunities that were developing in Northern Virginia because of that population overflow. Okay. Um, can you tell us a little bit about Governor J. Lindsey Almond as well? Governor Almond uh, was one of the leaders uh, publicly of the massive resistance effort. He did it because of pressure from the Bird, uh, the existence of the Bird organization. Senator Bird Sr. was still alive then and uh, dominated as an individual. And uh, Governor Allman was, when he was Attorney General, was beginning to show some independence of the organization, and <clears throat> he had to uh, buck the Bird organization in order to be nominated for governor in 1957. Uh, they, the, the Bird organization, wanted uh, governor or what turned out to be Governor uh, Bonson uh, Stanley um, in 1957, but uh, Allman uh, sought the support of the Byrd organization, did not get it, and declared independently that he was going to be a candidate for governor and had enough support throughout the state that the Bird Organization recognized they couldn't stop Holman. So uh, he, he got to be governor in 1957. He was, uh, he was a leader, however, in the massive resistance effort. 
he, uh, one of his fam famous quotes was, I would rather lose my right arm than to have one nigger child going to the white schools of Virginia. You can hear him saying it almost now. Uh, so he really was a leader in that massive resistance effort. But I think he regretted it, and uh, from conversations I had with him, after massive resistance was all over, he uh, uh, told me that when he had called Senator Byrd to tell him that he was not going to go to jail as part of the massive resistance effort and that he was going to support the continuation of a school system in Virginia, contrary to what Byrd wanted, uh, that uh, he uh, he showed his independence of the Bird Organization by doing that. Uh, and uh, I think basically he realized that he had been wrong in the massive resistance, but had publicly committed himself to the cause of it uh, to such an extent that he couldn't get away from it. Um. Can you tell us anything about uh, Governor Albertus S. Harrison? Not really. He, okay. he was a good governor. He uh, uh, preceded Mills Godwin. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, was, uh, he, uh, he, he, he was the one who really, in so many words, said, let's stop looking at the past and get away from this discrimination against the black people recognize that people are here and that they're citizens and that they're entitled to participate in the whole picture. And uh, as I said a few minutes ago, created the commission that uh, created the community college system, which was an economic development uh, in itself. And uh, uh, he uh, He really should be recognized as the beginning of the real turnaround from submission to the Bird Organization to an opener, but more open system of government, recognizing both parties okay. and all the people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, can you tell us anything about uh, Virginia Delegate James Thompson? Only that he was the majority leader when uh, in the House of Delegates during my time as governor, okay. and uh, he was uh, opposed to some of the things that I advocated, um, among others, mm -hmm. the creation of a cabinet. I think that uh, part of his opposition to the cabinet was that he didn't want a Republican to get credit for a major uh, re uh, reform of the governmental structure in Virginia. But uh, he, and he started out pretty negative toward me, though he recognized that the General Assembly was not generally opposed to me. They were going to listen to what I had to say and make decisions on the merits and uh, not make decisions on the basis of uh, Democratic Party politics, which uh, he would have preferred if he could have gotten it done, but he changed in his attitude toward me, particularly with regard to George Mason University, because he was, uh, well, two things. He was surprised that I put money in the budget for transit, which he had been fighting for a long time in his role as a delegate from Northern Virginia. And he was very pleased that I was doing what he wanted done in that regard. And he, that made him a little softer the, to, in his opposition to Wings that I wanted. He also uh, was very pleased with the board that I created when George Mason became a, an independent university. One of the reasons, of course, that he liked the board was he was one of the members of it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you can understand his bias, but he 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 did he was pleased with what I had 
done in those two areas, and we basically got along. Okay. <clears throat> uh, can you tell us about John T. Till Hazel? Till Hazel was a prominent real estate developer and lawyer in Northern Virginia that I had come to know pretty well. He was uh, in the same uh, military class that my brothers-in-law were uh, and for their military service. And uh, he was a, basically a Republican and was very friendly to me and supportive of me. And he too was very pleased, extremely pleased with the board uh, makeup that I of the board that I appointed when uh, Mason became independent. Mm -hmm. He too was a part of that group, so the bias was natural. And he was a Harvard guy too. He is a Harvard and Harvard Law School, right? Okay. Um, can you also tell us a little bit about uh, Governor Charles Robb? Um, I don't know much about Charles Robb. I know Charles Robb is, is a friend and remains a friend today. Uh, I don't remember much about his term as governor. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he uh, probably was kind of pushed into the race for governor because of his marriage situation. He was, uh, he married, uh, Linda Robb, or Linda uh, Johnson, and her, her father was president of the United States, and that created a natural uh, path for him to follow. And I think that kind of led him into the governor of uh, candidacy. I don't think he was much interested in it, and I don't think he did much while he was governor. Okay. Um, so we have another round of, of um some information about some some uh, people, and the first uh, for this question is uh, Delegate C. Harrison Mann. I don't know him. Okay, that's all right. Uh, John Norville Gibson Finley, who was uh, George Mason's first director from 1957 to 1963. He was ahead of me, and I don't know him. Okay, that's all right. Uh, Senator Charles Fenwick. He was prominent leader in the Senate of Virginia and was representative of Northern Virginia, and I knew all of that, but I never met the man, and I don't know anything about okay. him. Okay. Uh, Lauren A. Thompson, who was uh, chancellor for George Mason College from 1966 to 1972, and the first president of George Mason University from 1973 to 1974. I didn't remember that. I okay. don't remember that. And, That's uh, all right. <laughs> Did not know him. That's okay. Um, and the last one is uh, uh, George W. Johnson, who was president of George Mason University from 1978 to 1996. He came after my term as governor, but right. he I did know him, mm -hmm. and I uh, was associated with him during some of those years. And I do know that he was a very active, effective leader of George Mason University and it had tremendous progress during his term as president. Right. Okay. Um, so can you describe the important developments that contributed to your winning the governorship in 1969? Virginia had been moving, as evidenced by the participation in presidential politics, toward a more independent status. It had never voted for a Republican president before except in 1928 when the real issue was a religious issue. Uh, but it was beginning to uh, break over and uh, you, you, were, you were beginning to recognize that Virginia was independent and not dedicated to whatever the bird machine might direct. And I just felt that uh, an appeal based on the platform of let's have a two-party competitive situation in Virginia. I, I told the two drugstore town story all over the state. If you have one drugstore in your town, you'll have your prescription filled 
when the drug, druggist gets ready to fill it. If you have two drug stores, you'll get it filled when you need it and when you want it because of the competitive pressure. And that was something that Virginia by that time was willing to listen to. And I think that they uh, also recognized that the Republican Party had been neglected by the Byrd organization and it was time to, you know, if you had a, an attractive candidate on the Republican Party who made sense, let's try him for a time. And all of those things boiled together and uh, plus I ran a very active campaign four years at a time, starting in 65 and continuing through 1969. The press says that I had a unsuccessful campaign in 65. My description of it is I had a four-year campaign that began in 65 and ended in 1969. <laughs> um, so as governor, you had many significant accomplishments. Um, which ones please you the most to recall? Which one what? Um, as governor, you had many significant accomplishments. So which of those accomplishment, uh, accomplishments please you the most to recall? Well, uh, I was determined to, uh, as I said in my inaugural address, uh, improve the racial relations situation in Virginia. And I think I did. We had great opportunities. Um, the particularly the uh, fact that the busing decrees of the federal court, which required uh, a mixing of students uh, on a non-racial basis uh, in the public schools, um, was a great opportunity for me. Um, it, it happened in, on the, the, the decree requiring busing became effective in September of my first year in office. And my children were going to the public schools because we had been interested in public schools from the beginning of time as far as our family was concerned. Our attitude about private schools, which my wife attended uh, part of her time, uh, was that if we need particular attention, we'll go to a private schools that can provide that particular attention. But otherwise, we're very strong believers in public schools, and we're going to support the public schools by having our children attend the public schools. <clears throat> that happened in the face of the requirements for busing. And when it, it also gave me an opportunity to demonstrate uh, by action as well as words that we believe in um, what's required by the Constitution of the United States, and that is that all people, regardless of race, have equal opportunities, and that was applied particularly to public schools. So when we marched our kids to school on the 1st of September in 1970, uh, although they were going to be heavily uh, populated by black people. It was an opportunity to say we believe in it, see we, we're going to comply with it, and we're demonstrating that publicly. So it was a thrilling opportunity, and I recognized that at the time. I wanted to show that we're recognizing black people the same as white, and that was, a, you couldn't have asked a better opportunity right. to, to okay. show it. Um, so as you mentioned, one of the, the more memorable images of your term in office is uh, the one of you taking your daughter, uh, Taylor? Taylor. Taylor, to school on the first day. Um, why did you choose the Richmond City Public Schools instead of a private school for your daughter? Because of our basic public interest right, in right. public schools. Okay. Um, so moving on, uh, what do you think is the legacy of President Nixon's Southern strategy in Virginia and the rest of the South? Well, it certainly created a, a, a turnover to the Republican Party by name in the South. It's the same group of people who are very conservative and active in the leadership of politics in the South. It's just a name change. They were the 
Southern Democrats, now Republicans in the South. And uh, the part of the legacy of the Nixon administration is changing that name. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the legacy includes uh, imbuing, imbuing the Republican Party in the South with a racial uh, bias that uh, uh, was basically white supremacist. And that's unfortunate to make a racial party out of the Republican Party, which created by Abraham Lincoln and was on the opposite side of the racial issues from the very beginning. But that made it a racial party. And that's still overtones as evidenced by the uh, hatred for the president of the United States who happens to be black now. It's unfortunate, and that's an unfortunate part of the legacy from the Bird or from the Nixon organization. Okay. Um, do you think your political career might have had a different outcome if you had supported uh, Harry Flood Bird Jr. instead of Ray Garland in the 1972 Senate race in Virginia? Oh, that's a very iffy question. <laughs> uh, uh, it's just beyond the. Uh, possibility, so let's not bother about oh, that. That's all right, that's all right. Uh, so do you recall the day that you signed H-210 into law, making George Mason College independent of the University of Virginia on April 7th, 1972? Oh, I recall that I did it and that there was a crowd around it and that everybody was excited about <laughs> it and I shared the excitement, but I don't remember any more about the details. Okay. Uh, so you've, you've described uh, some of the following as, as key post-politics accomplishments in your book, Opportunity Time. And one is uh, creating the Washington Metropolitan Airports Authority um, and saving Amtrak and also establishing the Center for Innovative Technology. So can you tell us a little bit about those, those things? Uh, well, uh, I don't get credit for the Center for Innovative Technology except in the sense that I was president of it after it had been created. It was created as a result of efforts by Governor Bilal's and uh, uh, I think uh, Bilal's really did it. Um, but, uh, and I've lost track of the other part oh. of that question. Um, so some of the other uh, things that you've done were saving Amtrak? Uh, I, put, I was part of the uh, board of directors of Amtrak because I believed in uh, a system of national passenger rail transportation. And I served on the board and supported that theme, but I didn't have anything to do with saving uh, Amtrak. It survived on its own. Right. Um, and also creating the Washington Metropolitan Airports Authority. Um, I, I, my mind's a blank on that one. That's okay. Um, so do you think that, that each of, of these accomplishments are still contributing uh, to the Commonwealth and the nation so many years later? Clearly so, yes. Yeah. Um, Amtrak is increasing its patronage every year mm -hmm. since uh, the beginning of my term. Um, the uh, existence of a competitive political situation, which we do have in Virginia now, we have a strong Republican Party, for, uh, particularly national elections, and we have a strong statewide Democratic Party. And the fact that those two entities, political entities, are competing with each other has brought a more progressive accomplishment in the actual legislation that's passed and in the leadership of the governors who have been in office since 
we got those competitive pictures, uh, competitive uh, influences on the state mm -hmm. selection of officers. Right. So I think, yes, we've had, we've made a contribution. Oh, I can tell you personally that Amtrak is a wonderful service yeah. and a lifesaver when you need to get from D.C. to New York. It's quick, Perfect. efficient. Yeah. I love it. Right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how do you feel about two of your family members, uh, your daughter Anne and her husband, carrying on the Halton legacy of public service to the Commonwealth? I'm very proud of that. Uh, Tim was uh, uh, captured by my daughter when they were uh, at law school together. And that came back somewhat fortuitously because Tim originally was in the class ahead of Anne at the Harvard Law School. He dropped out to be a missionary for a year, and so when he came back to law school, that put him in the class with Ann, and that's where he met Ann, and that's where uh, Ann grabbed him and made a Virginian out of him. <laughs> she, there's an incident that occurred when I was in Boston while I was at the uh, American Council of Life Insurance as general counsel. <clears throat> I visited her while she was in law school. We were standing in the back of one of those big classrooms that descends down to the professor's desk. And she said, Dad, you see that curly-headed boy down there by the, by the uh, teacher's desk? Yes, he's the one. He doesn't know it yet, <laughs> but he's the one. And I've got some competition in Kansas City, but I'll take care of that. <laughs> And he's the one. <laughs> so she picked him out, brought him to Virginia, and he had never had the first interest in politics, not even himself or through his family. And uh, I encouraged him to get into public service, but when he made his first move in public service, it was to the city council of, city, of the city of Richmond. And I said, when I first heard about it, are you crazy? His reaction was, well, you told me to get into public service, and I <laughs> did. What do you mean? Well, pub public service on the city council of Richmond is likely to be the burying place for budding politicians. <laughs> <laughs> but he accomplished something that I couldn't believe, and that was uh, made a united effort of a group of black and white citizens on the city council of the city of Richmond and got them to act as a unit and consider issues on the basis without regard to race and did a marvelous job and that led him to the lieutenant governor's job and then governor and now the United States Senate. So it was a great opportunity and I'm very proud of his accomplishments along mm -hmm. those lines. Uh, so did you ever expect to see family members in public service after you? I never had many real thoughts about that, whether mm -hmm. before. No. The, uh, the, 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 the girls, including a doctor, Taylor, and Anne, uh, they, they're they interested in public service, but they're not interested in candidacy. Uh, I th had thought that uh, the boys might, and Dwight did uh, run for the uh, attorney general in the state of Oregon, where he now lives. But uh, I, I was a little surprised at that. Uh, but neither one of them has been seriously interested in uh, public service as a career. And so I'm not surprised either way on that. Mm -hmm. um, so do you foresee further developments in their political careers? or? Dwight's a good one to watch. He might uh, end up in uh, a <laughs> statewide office again in Oregon, mm -hmm. but we'll see. Okay. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add about your service to the Commonwealth of Virginia and or George Mason University? I'm very proud of George Mason University. It's uh, in a strategically, uh, in a strategic situation in Northern Virginia where the big population is it has done exactly what you had hoped that a large urban university would do. It's serving a wonderful purpose, and 
I'm very proud to have been a part of supporting it through the years. Um, I'm not sure there's anything further on that question. No, I think that's it. So uh, thank you so much for meeting with us today. Okay. Thank you.